Good afternoon. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. We welcome all of you who are watching via Zoom. And we do not have any proclamations, but we have one presentation. Actually, yes, just one presentation tonight. And the first one will be by GATSO USA regarding the automated traffic enforcement systems. Oh, so, so he was going to be here physically? Oh, okay. That's fine. No problem. Hey, Steve. We, yes. I can hear you fine, but I can't hear um, Chief at all. I don't know if that mic was on. Just wanted to let you know for the recording. Yeah, can you hear me now? Perfectly, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, his mic was off. Yep. Okay. All right, so we will uh, move down the agenda for items that are marked after that. And there are not any items on the rest of page one, two, three, or four. Are there any of those items that anybody on the city council wishes to discuss or has a question about? Okay, if not, we'll move to page five. And we have a few items at the top of the page before the regular agenda. Are there any of those items anybody wishes to discuss or comment on? Okay, if not, we'll move on to the regular agenda. Steve? Yes. Sorry again, can you tell me what happened with the presentation that was, I, I know you guys were talking about, but I missed oh. having it Thursday or not at all? No, uh, the individual from Gatso is flying in and he's going to physically be here. So we're not sure where he is. We're going to hopefully still try to do that tonight or this evening if he's uh, still on his way from the airport. Gotcha. Okay, so thank you. That, That's fine. Yeah. I just didn't know if if, uh, if it was falling off or moved to Thursday. Um, cool. Hopefully he shows up and he's okay. That's all right. We're not sure either. So <laughs> we will find out. Okay, so under the regular agenda, A1 and A2 are not marked. Any discussion on either one of those? Okay, if not, we'll move on to the first item marked for discussion on page five. That is item A3, a resolution approving a consultant services agreement with Eubank Capital LLC regarding the request for qualification and request for proposals process with respect to banking and investment services. Go ahead, Leanne. Thank you. Um, just as a reminder, this is a, in alignment with our strategic plan focus area two, efficient and effective government, with the goal of being to generate additional revenue and the strategy being to maximize investment revenue strategies as outlined in the new policy. And then kind of how we are, where we're at in this process, uh, the new investment policy was approved on April 22nd. At that time, staff had directed I mean, staff was directed to receive proposals. Um, we have received two proposals. The one before council came with high remarks from both the city of West Des Moines and is actively engaged in this same process with the city of Fort Dodge. Um, one might ask the question, why use a third party? Why aren't we doing this internally? I would say first, the third party gives independence from outside influences, saves us time and provides an objective analysis for council recommendation. I mean, for instance, you might say that we might use the investment oversight committee or staff to create this. However, um, on the investment oversight committee, there is a banker who probably would submit a proposal. So that would be one. And then secondly, we are revamping this process. Um, just in history here, we have done RFPs internally for banking services. In fact, I actually wrote the last one and we're actually looking at reaching higher and changing the way we do it, um, professionalizing it. And as far as investment services, we haven't done one in at least 32 years. So we don't even have 
Um, so if you look kind of at the scope of work, it's broken down into four phases. The first phase being discovery, where the consultant will work, work with the client to review current banking arrangements, review financial information and statements, and to establish criteria for the RFQ, RFP process. I do see the Investment Oversight Committee playing a role in deciphering what that criteria will be. Phase two implementation, the consultant will be formulating the RFQ, RFP per identified criteria and parameters, will submit a draft review to all team members and review, revise as necessary and send out to identified parties. And then phase three is to review and examine all proposals received, request clarification if necessary and conduct interviews of selected candidates. And then of course, phase four is to make a final recommendation. And I do plan on that recommendation also going before the investment oversight committee and having full transparency on all proposals that were received for them to review and validate before bringing to council my final recommendation with their comments. With that, I'll open it up to questions of the council. Okay. Questions? Grant? Yeah, Leanne, can you uh, just recap what the total value of our investment portfolio is at this point? Roughly, round numbers, plus or minus. I should have brought that with me. I can, it's usually between 50 and 70 million total oh, in total. Okay. I mean, if you go back a slide, I did put on there just for your benefit, the amount of interest earned over the last five years, full fiscal year. So it wouldn't be including this fiscal year, but in the past five fiscal years, we earned $6.18 million sure. in interest. So I, the, the, the essence of this effort to have somebody craft an RFP that covers a complex set of uh financial management issues um for up not to exceed thirty five thousand five hundred dollars compared to the value of the portfolio that we are attempting to manage on behalf of the city seems to be a at least in my judgment a wise expenditure given the fact that this is really benchmarking our whole approach mm -hmm. for the first time in 30 years so just comment and thanks for that information but I would also think that after going through this entire process, there might be some simpl simplification to the banking, maybe some time savings opportunities for your staff. Mm -hmm. And if you spend $35,000 and we get the right result, uh, which hopefully should be uh, on a year to year basis, an increase in our investment return uh, out of a million dollars a year, a million and a quarter a year, it doesn't take a lot to pay for that. Uh, what what is your uh, one question I would have is, I know we haven't done this for a very long time. Looking forward or down the road, how often in the future do you think this would need to be uh, done? I was actually just looking at uh, some of the recent RFQs done by other cities, and I'm still seeing a five year with a renewal up to three years. Okay. Primarily. I know in today's day and age, it gets harder and harder and harder to be moving your banking. And that's another right. another thing I will appreciate you, Bank Capital, trying to figure out the differential on, you know, to make it worth moving. What is that gap? Um, and I just want to also add one of the things I'm most excited about. When we've done this processes in the past internally, it has been a very passive approach where we've created an RFQ internally. We've reached out to numerous banks via either calling, emailing, or just sending a mailing, and then just waiting until we receive where this is going to be one of those organized where we do a, a pre-proposal meeting with the banks and go through that Q&A process. So I'm really excited to learn also a new and better way of doing this in the future. I mean, I've been through this process before at the, the company I worked at. Uh, it's not something you do every year because it, switching banks and switching that entire process is a lot of work, takes a lot of time uh, in order to get all of that changed over. Uh, your scale would be much larger than what I dealt with, but uh, still there's a lot of moving parts that you have to, to manage and work on if there's a change in those banking relationships. So uh, anyway, Renee, did you have any comments or questions on this? So 
sorry, I always talk when the mute is going. No, I don't have any. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Okay, Chief, are we ready to go back to our initial presentation? Is this our gentleman from Gatsu? Okay, is he ready to go? If you need if you need 15 or 20 minutes, we can come back to you. Okay. All right. Well, why don't you go ahead and we'll why don't you introduce this presentation? So just for everybody listening, we're going to go back to the initial presentation that we talked about from GATSO USA regarding automated traffic enforcement systems. Well, this this is Dorian Gray. He's the, he's the rep uh, for uh, Census GATSO here. Uh, kind of wanted to do this as, as a conversation starter with you guys. We've got a motion later on uh, asking uh, you to direct us to draft an ordinance. Uh, but this would be one of many steps before anything would actually get approved. But we thought it'd be a good idea to see kind of an overview of what they've got to offer here and then uh, decide if you do want to implement something, this will give us an idea of what we can pick from and things like that. Thank you, Chief. Yep. Um, my name is Dorian Grubo. I'm the uh, National Sales Director for Census Gatso and a retired police sergeant from the state of Ohio. Um, our company was founded back in 1958. Uh, we developed the first speed camera system for the Dutch government uh, based off of a system we had uh, that was a timing system for our founder, who was a race car driver. Um, let's see, do I just hit the... Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, here's a picture. So in 1960, we came out with the first speed camera. In 1966, we came out with the first red light camera. We've been doing this for quite a long time. Um, yeah, next slide. We have over 50,000 installations currently worldwide in over 60 countries um, and across the United States. Um, we are currently all over the state of Iowa. You've probably seen our programs in Cedar Rapids. We have a new one in Independence. We're down in LeClaire, Waterloo, Des Moines, uh, Muscatine. And what we provide is uh, a full managed services program. So from whatever the products are that the police department will be using for their speed enforcement program to image processing, to citation issuance, to uh, helping with the fine collection and the customer service, a full turnkey um, managed services program for traffic safety. Um, what we're talking about using or the equipment that we're talking about using is gonna be the T-Series camera, um, well, the T-Series platform for red light and speed. One camera does both. So it, it, it can do red light and speed simultaneously. And the one camera, as you saw there, that goes into the housing has multiple setups. Yeah, you can go forward a couple slides. Now you can keep going. Two more. Yeah, we'll get to the multiple solutions. Um, so one camera, can be used and the main the main purpose usually is the semi-portable fixed locations like in the top left but it, the same camera can be put on a tripod moved around we have it in ground-based uni uh, units um, we have done it in speed trailers before um, uh, the other very common one is uh, mobile units i know i've talked to the police department about mobile units before um, which can be moved around to different areas to, to manage speed um, the only one that can do red light and speed, obviously, is the, the portable fixed. It's above the road. Um, but it's a very easily moved solution. So all it needs is any type of pole that has 120 volts of electricity, and, and, and it can be put up in about 90 minutes once we know we have electrical at the pole. You can go ahead and next slide. Each T-series or our technology has uh, multi-lane function. So we can manage up to six lanes of speed, five lanes of red light. It monitors each and every individual lane and up to 32 cars individually within those lanes in its field. 
so it can it can enforce uh, on 32 cars uh, per second in its in its view, or actually under a second in shutter speed. Um, we also have vehicle classification. So our cameras do know the difference between commercial trucks and passenger vehicles and motorcycles, and some of that comes into play with um, studies. So some, sometimes street departments, engineering will want to know, well, how much traffic is actually coming down the roadway. We can actually tell you how many cars have been by, what the speeds of all of them are, and then the vehicle breakdown itself, how many were trucks, how many were cars, how many were motorcycles. Um, so it's helpful for, I know it's helpful for IDOT, it's helpful for uh, local engineering, and it's also helpful for the police department because in logging the speeds and, and, and volume of traffic as the program, any program commences, and you know how many tickets you've written and you know the volume of traffic from beginning and every month along the way, you can actually tell and show the percentage of speed compliance that you're gaining through your program. So you can actually show that the program is actually doing what it is meant to do. And that's not what you read in the paper of being a money grab or anything. It's actually reducing people's speeding and gaining compliance within an area. So the program can, can do that, track it and prove it. Um, with each event as it's called or any violation, there will be two still images, a plate crop and six to 12 seconds of video. Um, for any one of them, our cameras have in this in this one in red light scenario. This is enforcing on two different vehicles in two different lanes, running the same light simultaneously, and it can tell exactly to the tenth to the hundredth of a second how uh, how long the light was red before it entered the intersection. Uh, our cameras also, unlike some others, don't have any problem at night. That's the next slide. Um, we've done testing uh, at night running a bus lane. This is where our ability to tell the difference between commercial vehicles and cars. So we know that that's a car, not a bus. In a bus lane in complete dark, and we're able to absolutely capture a plate. Uh, we eat, the camera even has the ability to see through those tinted plate covers. So if you have a tinted plate cover on there, it can kind of remove, you know, add some light and look through the uh, tint to get to the actual plate. Uh, next. So with all this comes the back office, you know, the, the cameras are cameras, and they'll be around, they'll find um, whatever violations the police are looking to uh, enforce. Uh, those events will be sent from any of the cameras wirelessly to our servers, which are at NLETS, which is the National Law Enforcement Telecommunication System. Uh, that's in Arizona, and that's physically where our, our servers are housed. So we're an NLETS partner, which gives us access to run vehicles in all 50 states and Canada. Um, being an NLETS partner, we do get to store our servers there, they are secure there, and uh, we are audited by the federal government a couple times a year. So everything is, all the information and data is completely secure and meets DOD uh, encryption standards. Um, the back office, which is what the police department will use, the finance department, uh, if you do have a program, you would have your own hearings at first. So the, the administrative hearing court um, would all use the same back office. Um, there's all different pieces to the Zillion back office. It's very easy to use. I, I like to equate it to kind of learning how to use an iPhone. Um, it's kind of very straightforward and simple and can be taught um, very quickly. Um, on it, we have uh, everything from payments to um, to the enforcement part and the court function, so depending on who needs to have access and look at it. So yeah, you're okay to go ahead. Um, the timeline on any of these events are from the time a violation happens on day one, our team should be processing that and putting it into a violation form for police to review in the back office. So they would log in every day and look in their queue and see um, how many, tickets they have to review that day. They would review all the information. So what would be available to them is the two pictures, the video, the close-up of the plate. We would run the vehicle completely out. They would match the vehicle to the registered owner, make sure that's right, make sure the fine's right, make sure an event actually happened and they agree with it. If law enforcement officer does agree that the violation happened and it's all correct in front of them, 
they would approve it, which would put their electronic signature and badge number on that ticket to be mailed out. Um, so as we process it on day two, police next couple of days to get uh, everything processed and hopefully it's mailed out uh, the very next business day. So any day they approve, any citations they approve get mailed out automatically the next business day. Uh, reports. So I talked a little bit about how many cars going through and how that was good. We have reports for just about anything. On the police side, they'll be able to look and see how many events have happened in the last couple of days, last week, last quarter, whatever they need to present on. We will give them data to show how many cars have gone past um, over a specific set time that they want to look at and what percentage that they have gained in compliance for speed or red light or whatever they're enforcing in the area. That's so they can report on the success of the program. Uh, from finance standpoint, so the finance director of the city or whoever handles that would have access to all the daily transactions, anything happening with each ticket that has been processed, um, any daily intake, and then the, the bi-monthly um, or twice a month, every, yeah, the 15th and the, and, and the last day of the month, they would see finance reports from the uh, the sweeps that happen twice a month. So the money that has come in has been managed and then twice a month gets split up and swept to the city and whatever portion is ours to us, followed by three different finance reports that all meet with, um, well, at least we've never had a problem with any kind of state audits. So there's enough information in there to make sure that everyone is happy and in compliance and everything is very transparent. And again, the finance director can look at that daily. They can look at that when the reports come in, however they want to assess that. As well as when you're going to have your administrative hearings or a hearing process for people that want to contest that. Um, those dates can be set up electronically in our back office, our back end solution. Choose dates, times, uh, several at a time, um, and how many people that whatever hearing process you set up would want to see. So if you want to, if they want to cap it at 25 or 50 people at a time, no more than, than that can be entered into the system by the clerk or whoever you put in charge of that. The court dockets or the administrative hearing dockets are done by us. Uh, here's an example of them. So as people want to have a hearing, uh, they would be able to do that online or via the uh, phone number provided, which we would handle, and give them an option of the next two or three hearing dates. They'd pick one. They'd go in an electronic docket, wherever the hearing officer and the clerk would have access to the hearing docket. They would pull that up, go through court, just like any other court that you would go to, municipal court, uh, county court, anything like that. And uh, the hearing officer could just click, or the clerk, case by case. Um, that case will come up. They'll see the same exact thing the police did, the same exact thing the person that got the ticket saw. So they would see two images, the plate crop, the video, all the information, and anything attached to that file. So any phone calls that were made, however many notices went out, reminders, um, all paperwork, uh, everyone would see the same thing. The only difference here is if you go to the next slide, the administrative hearing officer has a ruling portal. So they can rule the person since, it, and since it's a civil citation, they rule them either liable or not liable. Um, they can transfer to a county court if that's what the person would like to do um, to contest it. Um, they can change the fine. Anything a judge in municipal court would do, they can do on here. They have full access and full judgment capabilities on this. Once it's ruled or entered by the clerk or the hearing officer, it's instantly updated to the um, to the court docket and then whatever happens is generates another piece of paper. We generate a piece of paper for everything. Next line. Yeah, you can go on, uh, yep, next slide. Yeah, one more. So correspondence, we send notices for everything. We send obviously the first notice, second notice. Um, if somebody requests to have a hearing, even if they've done it electronically via the website or called, we still send them a notice letting them know that this is what they've chosen. Um, 
if they go to court and they are found not liable, they get a notice saying you've been found not liable. You don't need to pay. If they're found liable, um, they get a notice letting them know how long they had to pay the fine and that they have what their finding was. And once they have paid, they get another receipt or notice letting them know that they have paid everything through their records. And then everything that's sent to them is electronically loaded up kind of right into their case packet to show uh, everything in case they need to come back to it later. Um, we also provide in-house call center. Um, we think it's important for our call center to be in-house and not farmed out to one of the giant call centers that might be, I don't know, taking shoe returns or Amazon returns, you know, half an hour before they're taking calls from the public asking about the tickets they received in the mail. So it's all in, well, I say it's all in-house. Due to COVID, we've found that no one actually needs to come in house anymore. Everyone actually works from home. Um, so we're able to have call centers basically all over. Um, very, yeah, and a percentage of tickets written, you generate a call, but um, each client's business rules are within the call center. So when somebody calls and asks, say, about a ticket they received in Marion, the call taker will know exactly how the police department and the city would like that handled. So if somebody calls and they've received a couple notices and if there's any breaks given or well, back in the day when there was late fees, uh, if the city wanted those waves for somebody calling in, the call center would know. I always kind of taken those out anyway through a Supreme Court decision. So it's not a factor anymore, but they have access to all the business rules of the way our clients would like their program handled and they act uh, accordingly. And that's why we have our own in-house call center. Uh, next slide. Our online payment portal, and you can go to the next slide, is not just a payment portal. I actually need to change the word in that. So on here, uh, several things. They'll be able to look at whatever ordinance that you would have passed. They'll be able to see the city's ordinance. Uh, they will be able to see um, their violation. Again, exactly what the police saw. Everyone sees the same thing. Everything's transparent. So they would see the full um, case package uh, against the vehicle. They would be able to request a hearing. They would be able to get an affidavit testifying the fact that they weren't operating the car and they could transfer liability through uh, an affidavit to whoever was driving the vehicle. Now, unfortunately, since it is a, a civil citation, if the person who they transfer liability to does not want to accept that liability, then it falls back on the registered vehicle owner. Um, they would also be able to see uh, anything that's come to them in the mail or anything that is with that case. So not just the case package or the, the violation itself, but if they're getting a second notice in the mail and they said, oh, I never got a first one, they would actually be able to view the first one right here um, and anything else that's going on with, uh, with the case. Um, and also they'd be able to pick their hearing from here. So they could just click on that. They would be able to see Im immediately the next two or three hearings that the municipality was having and pick one that fits their schedule. Uh, next slide. Oh, yeah, I shortened this one up for today. Um, so what we deliver is, I think, a full program, well-rounded, um, that takes care of about 99% of the work um, from bringing the equipment in, training everyone on how to use it, the back office. This program is not meant to come into where we're running 99% of the program, the, the city and the municipality is in charge of everything, every decision, everything that happens. Uh, we're just administering it. So when I say we're handling this stuff, it's just so that uh, finance doesn't get overwhelmed with a massive amount of payments coming in. Um, the police department doesn't have to act you know, hire a, a large amount of staff just to handle all of the uh, incoming calls and the incoming citations. You know, a lot of it's done. Citations can be gotten through pretty quickly. Um, I've not seen too many key cases where actually they have to assign a large staff to it. Um, so our program is meant to come in, partner with the city on traffic safety, provide 
the upfront services, the back end services, and assist in gaining traffic compliance. And we do all that for no cost. Um, all we do is in our contracts is take a portion of whatever paid revenue comes in. We take the small portion of the paid revenue. You have any questions? Well, I know you've done a very good job of describing the how and the mechanics behind the system. I think some of the key questions is the why. Why are we talking about this? Why is this gonna be an agenda item? And Chief, do you wanna discuss that now or you wanna discuss that later on when that comes up as an agenda item? Discuss it when it comes up as an agenda. Okay. Like I say, and I can, I'll answer any questions. I've got uh, statistics and things like that for you to look at. And like I said, it's kind of a first step. And I would would think that you're going to have time to come up with more questions and and get some feedback from the community before you'd ever be asked to implement anything going forward. But I think probably here in the next five minutes we'll be up to that motion. Okay. All right. So, are there any questions for Mr. Gray? Obviously, the chief will have some comments later on when we get to the agenda item. So questions for Mr. Gray, Randy. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. I just have a, a quick general question. The uh, photographs that you're showing here with the red light run um, all happen to be from the rear side of the vehicles. Can they also be set up so that they are projected from the front side? And the reason why is we have an intersection here in our community, Highway 13 and 151, where we have a lot of commercial big rig uh, that like to run that red light turning left going south. And as you well know that a lot of semi trailers are considered to be what's called a drop trailer. So that trailer could be registered in North Carolina, and it may be CRST uh, truck that's hauling it from here locally. So in order to obtain the correct information we need the tractor registration off of that is that something that can be set up uh to do so uh it can be yes there are other states that require um shots of the front because there are a few other states that actually require um, facial recognition with um, the driver um, we've done that before california is the big one um, it's harder to do but we have done it before. It can be done if, if there's, I mean, we wouldn't do it most likely at every location because it's just not needed. But yeah, if in, in areas where you might have very heavy commercial truck traffic with the trailers and you need to get the shot of the front plate on the rig, uh, it can be done, it can be accomplished. I know sure. the engineering has that capability. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And I only use CRST as an example. So obviously they're not a, a, an offender, but I'm in the insurance business and I have had a couple of, uh, insureds where they have been swiped by um, semi trucks turning too wide because that is a two turn lane and they don't even know that they've hit another vehicle and uh, we, we lose sight of them. So we, we have nothing to go by um, to identify those. So I'm looking at that in this through a couple of the different lenses uh, in my professionalism. So thank you for your presentation. Yes. Uh, also to your, to your, I know the chief will give you statistics from here, um, but I'll just let you know why it's becoming more and more common across the country, especially coming out of COVID is you've got uh, the NTSB now recommending it uh, nationwide. You have uh, National Highway Transportation Safety, um, the International Chiefs Association, uh, and everyone recognizing it as an actual speed calming or traffic safety measure. Um, statistically, 10% of all the volume of traffic that you have coming through town it's not from residents, it's coming through town, are traveling at over 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And that's what people are trying to bring down. So especially coming out of COVID for uh, lessening law enforcement's uh, time at people's windows and such like that, it, it has become a bit more popular coming out. And we, we have seen an uptick, but uh, that's, that's the usual. That's, or that's the main reason everyone is starting to move forward on or at least the, the programs are growing actually much more rapid than we've seen in years past. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Gray? I, I have a general one. I don't, it's not for him, but while he's standing there, um, I, this is on our agenda to vote for on Thursday, true? Yes. 
because I thought Chief just said something about, you know, giving time so people can hear about this. Um, I, I'm just a little concerned that this is a big, this would be a, a something big and different coming to Mary. And I would be curious how people feel about it. Um, I also, unless I misread something, I was looking at um, some of the Senate bills and there's currently in Iowa, the study bill 1176, which if we proved this would strike all that down if it's passed anyway, unless I'm missing something. Like there's something currently barring this other than the, um, the ones on 380. Uh, yeah, Renee, the item, the item on the agenda for Thursday, and we'll talk about in a little bit tonight as well, is a motion directing staff to draft a city ordinance. So we are not doing anything to approve this this week, but only be talking about whether we should move ahead to draft a city ordinance regarding automatic, automatic traffic enforcement. Uh, so I think when we talk later tonight, uh, we get to that item C3, then the chief will provide some comments at that time. So okay. are there any, is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. I can wait. Um, let me see if I have anything for the gentleman before he leaves. I was writing all kinds of stuff. Um, can Do these cameras allow you to solely focus on red light runs? Like, can you only use it for that? Or is it always red light runs and speeding? Can you, is it there flexibility there? Yes, it can be either or. Uh, it can be just red light. Uh, it can be red light and speed or just speed. So it can be any of those things. Um, I should say the camera is also always running. It's running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So at least the video portion. So the, the camera is running video 24 seven high def video, which uh, yeah. the police department has access to uh, whenever they need. And they can pull video up to 30 days back. Um, and then as to where the uh, I think it was the where the state legislation was that that did not make it through. Uh, oh, it already died. Session. It already died. Yeah, the session's <laughs> over, so it's already dead till next year. And I know Cedar Rapids and Des Moines are working on um, discussing a regulatory bill with the state, um, which I think they're at least the folks that keep putting it up for. Um, taking it away or now wanting to maybe discuss some regulatory issues with it. Okay, and then just one last question, at least for now. Um, you mentioned the mobile units and the fact that you can you know, move those around and target specific areas. Is that an option on its own or is that only in conjunction with the um, fixed mounted? No, it's an option on its own. Um, okay. Yeah, the chief has ability to choose um, whatever piece of equipment that they need. And, and, you know, the master service agreement just covers a program. You can add and subtract equipment as your program grows or subtracts. We don't think any speed program is you need to know right when you come out of the gate, nor should you inundate any city with a, a large quantity of product in the beginning. Police department knows where problem areas are, whatever equipment they need to deal with is, is what they go with. And then if the program changes or if there's other issues that come up later, they can just request to add equipment. Okay, so the agenda item also talked about that this presentation would include cost and benefits to the city. Can you make sure that you outline that for us? Okay, uh, there, well, the benefits obviously are the enhanced safety and um, of course there's revenue with any traffic violation. I mean, that's even in criminal traffic cases, that's, that's uh, the benefit. There is no cost, so. Um, the only money that we receive is through uh, um, a percentage of each paid ticket. So and what percentage is that? I would have to actually look at the contract we send you. I cover so many states. I would imagine it's probably about um, $38 per paid ticket on an average ticket that is usually about $100 in this state. So, so 40%? Yeah, just under. Well, yeah, it's usually 38% or $38, whichever is higher. Okay. Okay, thanks. And that's the only cost that we take. So everything, you know, there's no other secondary costs or upgrade costs or anything. That's just the one fee that we have. Okay, does anybody else have questions for Mr. Gray? Grant? And I, I'm sorry, I 
called him Mr. Gray. It's Gray Ball, and that's my fault. Oh, I'm sorry. I've yeah. got Mr. Gray written down. Mr. Gray Ball. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, first off, I I appreciated uh, the uh, coverage you gave during your presentation. You answered a couple of questions that I had. Um, one residual question that I um, am curious about is the image capture and image storage is is the image storage at all uh, resonant on the camera itself or is it is it transferred to the cloud via a batch routines or does it uh, is it continuously transmitted and then I guess the question I'm curious about is is it transmitted over 5g 4g or some other linkage it's transferred through a wireless air card in in the system itself although there is onboard storage so for you know for example if there's problems with the wireless card inside uh, it will store several thousand events before it would need to be emptied manually um, but our engineers would actually know um, that the air card is not transmitting um, and just so happens that our, our engineer for Iowa lives in Marion. So you would probably get pretty quick service uh, since he lives here. Then one last question is uh, with that local storage upon uh, uh, failure of the air card, is that uh, locally encrypted? It's yeah, secure in the camera. Okay. It's not, it's not like a picture. It's actually just a data stream. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for Mr. Grayball? All right, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right, we'll jump back into the agenda, picking up on item A4 under the regular agenda. And this is talking about a public hearing regarding the proposed adoption of a fiscal year 2020-2021 budget amendment. Go ahead, Zach. Okay. Um, good afternoon, City Council. Um, this is the second budget amendment that's coming before you for this fiscal year. We typically do these twice a year, um, once at the beginning of the year, sometimes in October or November. Um, and if you recall this last year, um, it, um, it was primarily done in order to address the derecho moving forward. Um, so with that large budget amendment, a second one is only needed in the, in the event towards the end of the year, if we expect to exceed any of our, our expenditure categories by function category. Uh, func uh, fortunately, this year, uh, we are not with the exception of one area, which is debt. A um, couple slides later, I'll give the details of that. But overall, I would call this somewhat of a light year in any budget amendments. Um, next slide, please. Um, the net changes to the budget, what it would do is actually add $85,000 in additional revenue. So. It, a, a plus position for the revenue side of it. And as I mentioned, um, debt service or the other financing sources is the majority of what is included in this budget amendment. Um, transfers um, to remind city council are the movement of dollars between funds. So those dollars aren't really a increase or decrease. It's just more so moving them from one fund to another. Uh, and we have a, um, a whopping $5,500 in miscellaneous in there, just a right size. Um, one of the changes this year that I'll talk about on the expenditure side. Um, similarly, on the next line down for expenditures is the other side of the $1.1 million for debt service changes. Um, there's transfers out of $254,000, um, general government of $181,000, and then capital projects of $127,000. Uh, next slide. So here's the granular detail of what makes up those figures. Um, the, $1.5 million is, um, has come before city council already earlier this year, part of a resolution in order to um, refinance some of our um, general obligation debt series. So this just trues that up. This is the required portion because when we set aside the budget, if we make any changes from our debt service figures, that requires us to make those changes because we will go over budget. Um, in this case, since we um, changed the initial figures we had in the budget. Um, on the transfers inside, similarly, there were two resolutions that came before city council a couple months back um, regarding a um, right sizing or a um, true up of a, of a TIF agreement that the, um, that the city entered into a number of years back. And then that uh, $5,500 is for um, the AARP grant um, for the electric um, assisted trikes. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, on the expenditure side, uh, the flip side of this, um, debt service, that entire chunk is our entire top chunk with the exception of $20,000 in there is all due to the refinancing um, of different um, debt service instru instruments for the general obligation um, refinancing series. The $20,000 is what we've set aside as a budgeted amount in the event that we need to draw from our line of credit that we came before city council for earlier in the year for temporary financing for um, the debt actual cost is also in there. Um, on the transfer outside, these are just um, the culmination of actually the same $127,000 done twice in there. Um, the next line, this, this is really the area of, of change in there, 100, 181,000 in general government. And it really is primarily made up of two areas um, with the exception of the trikes. The first is the increase in legal expenses. Um, city council is aware of a number of um, different issues that have required um, more legal time and um, outside legal counsel this year. So we're rec we're um, putting into the budget about $150,000 in there for the legal budget. Um, fortunately, the the uh, the departments that that goes under um, overall um, are doing well, but we wanted to make sure to right size that in um, the division 640, which is legal. Um, secondly, um, we had a um, one of the security concerns that we had come for the city and some of the opportunities allowed for us to do an investment and move it ahead a little bit earlier this year that um, came before city council as well. So that added another $20,000 to this year's budget in order to move that forward. Um, we're looking to have some um, offsetting expenditures in order to um, stand our budget with technology in that area, but we did want to um, add that to the budget as well. And then lastly, this is the total amount of the trikes because we received a grant for half of the amount, the other half was covered by the city. Um, and then lastly is the um, other portion of that um, capital project cost the two payoff costs of 127,000 for that TIP payment. And with that, I'd um, gladly take any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, thank you, thank Zach. You. All right, move on to page six of our agenda tonight and uh, we'll start with public services. First item is a resolution approving contract with Conlin Construction as construction manager for the new public service yes. maintenance facility. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, the first item is uh, the uh, actual contract. This is for the new facility. Um, staff is recommend moving forward with this contract. What we anticipate probably for the first five months is typically we're gonna put together construction schedules and a scope uh, where we're gonna go here from, from uh, this point. Quite a bit of things we gotta work through um, with insurance and things like that. So for the most part, we're gonna be working on planning. Okay. Questions? Any questions on that, Grant? I know we talked about this once before as I uh, surveyed their uh, proposal documentation, but I'm obligated to ask again, um, are they going to be uh, assigning a quality control engineer or uh, inspector? There'll be two to three people on site all the time. Okay. Yep. Great. Yep. <laughs> Okay, item B2. Item B2, this is the uh, contract or the proposed contract for the repairs to the existing public service maintenance facility during the derecho. This facility took quite a shot. Uh, as of right now, the scopes can include complete replacement of the roof system, insulation, uh, mechanical and exhaust systems, as well as the uh, reconstruction of the entire front office. So um, this is gonna be uh, um, segregated through insurance. Um, as well as their fees. Uh, the proposed contract is for 6% of the total costs uh, moving forward. This is something we're gonna uh, put together a schedule pretty quickly on because we do have to get these repairs completed. So. Okay, any questions on V2? Okay, all right. And B3 talking about Sanitary sewer increases. Yes, sir. These are this is the initial reading for the uh, proposed fee increases in in the sanitary sewer uh, fee structure. Uh, what we are proposing is going from 410 to 439 per variable charge. That is something we improved uh, in this next year's fiscal budget. Um, one thing we 
we do want to advise the city council on is that this is not going to be static. There's a couple of things we're tracking in this fund. Uh, for one, we did with our variable treatment charges, we did see some surcharges this last year. And so the fund is starting to dwindle down. Um, we think we got a pretty good handle on what that's going to look like. Um, but we're going to revisit this back in November just to make sure we're, we're ahead of the game. The other thing is, um, Alana has been talking with the city of Cedar Rapids. They have a proposed capital improvement plan for the uh, wastewater treatment plant. So hopefully by then we'll know exactly what uh, Marion Shear is, is going to be with that plant. So probably this fall we, we may be back. Uh, with the city council looking at this fund again once we get more information. Yeah, there's certainly been some publicity about the major in, in investment that Sierra Rapids is going to have to make. And yep. uh, just so the council's reference and uh, those smiley faces, uh, this is called the Ames Water Survey. Every year they do a survey of uh, fees, uh, both water and sanitary sewer. It's hard to read, but as you can see, our fee structures are pretty um, competitive. Pretty much, I can't highlight it, but uh, basically everything, the three columns to the left are the ones we focus on. Um, the, the three columns to the right are heavy industrial users. We really don't have those within Marion. But as you can see where the smiley faces are, that's where we're at in fees. We're, we're very, very low compared to other cities. So we want to keep it there, um, but that's how we, we're stacking up. Go to the next slide. And then here's kind of a graph. We like to compare them to other cities. Uh, the Cedar Rapids one, um, Zach pointed out, they're at, actually at 26, just over $26 of the rest of them. That's where we compare. That would be our proposed fee going forward for a, a resident that utilizes 600 uh, cubic feet of, of water. So, okay. Any questions on B3? Okay, let's move to B4 regarding establishing the base collection fee for solid waste. Again, uh, this was part of the fiscal year 22 budget. Uh, the base fees as proposed would increase by $1.25. A lot of the fee increases are, one thing One thing we lost this year was our recycling incentive with the solid waste agency. That was just over $66,000. So we took a revenue hit on that. Additionally, we're faced with an increasing cost of the recycling program. That market is very difficult to um, track right now. So the recycling fees are anticipated to go up and then uh, the remaining uh, fee increases are just to cover our operational expenses. You want to the next slide? And so compare us to other uh, communities that have municipal solid waste collections. Uh, that's where we stand um, with comparable services. So again, pretty competitive um, compared to the same type of services. Okay. That's good. Uh, good comparison. Good comparison. Good comparison information to have. So we appreciate you adding that in. Any questions on B four? All right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now public safety. And any questions about items C one or C two on the agenda? Okay. So now we'll talk about the motion directing staff to draft a city ordinance regulating the use of automated traffic enforcement cameras within our city limits. I kind of feel like city engineer Mike Barkalo tonight. I'm taking up everybody's time. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize. It got a little convoluted on between the presentation, but, but <laughs> so anyway, the, the ordinance that, that we're asking you to uh, uh, tell us to draft, it would encompass things like setting a fine schedule, um, an appeal schedule, uh, what we would do about collecting, things like that. Uh, we've got some examples from other cities here in Iowa that are already using uh, the ATE systems. Uh, I've given them the care to kind of look at. I'm sure she's going to kind of incorporate some of those. They've been through the ringer. They've been through court. It's been up to the Iowa Supreme Court, and they've been found to be lawful uh, under the policies that they have in other cities right now, Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, for example. So what I would envision is uh, once she's done with that, because I know she's not very busy and she's going to have plenty of time to get this done, is we would bring that to you uh, and present it. And then you can look that over and then we'd ask for that to be approved. And then we would go into an approval, probably a separate approval for the ATE implementation. Uh, from my point of view, I think it's uh, I think it's a good program. 
I, I wouldn't be here tonight if I didn't think it was something that we can use. Uh, I don't envision, uh, like Mr. Grayball said, I, I'm not looking to blanket the entire city um, uh, with cameras, but I do think there's, there's certain areas we can use them in. Uh, it's an efficient way of doing things. It'll help us kind of keep uh, keep our numbers lower on officers. It'll free officers up to do other things. I've got some statistics in here um, when that starts running and, and I can kind of show you what we're looking at as far as accidents, red light violations, speeding, um, and, and it hopefully answer some of the questions that you have. Um, again, I've talked to other agencies that are using these. I hear nothing but, but good things about it. Uh, the cost to us essentially is going to be a, a putting a pole up and putting electricity to it. Uh, we will have to have somebody process uh, tickets after they're sent to us of whether or not it is a good violation or if it's not. I kind of right now envision that would be a day, a day shift sergeant. So it's not going to be adding any staff uh, to what we've got. Um, and I do think, you know, there's been concerns with the police reform about racial profiling. And again, this is... Um, one way of alleviating some of those concerns, at least in areas where we've got cameras up because it kind of takes that human element out of it. Uh, it's not gonna completely eliminate our need to do traffic enforcement uh, for the patrol guys, but it's at least at the major set intersections that we'll talk about here, uh, I think it's gonna, it, it's gonna take that away from us. Um, so anyway, the primary cause of accident. So I went back five years, I did 2016 to 2020. Uh, 114 accidents we had here in town where, we, where the primary cause was running a red light. Um, again, you can see the injuries up there, 322 occupants, 241 vehicles. Terry, you want to switch that? Can I switch this? Oh. <laughs> uh, the trouble intersection. So these are the ones I looked at. The Iowa DOT runs a crash survey or a crash site uh, where you can pull up every traffic accident. You can zoom it into a city, you can zoom it into an intersection. And so these are our, kind of our big ones. Uh, highway 151 and Highway 13, um, about 9% of those uh, are caused by running a red light. And that's the, the uh, primary cause. There may be a secondary cause, um, but that's the primary one. 151 and Eagle View, that's right in front of Walmart. Uh, highway 100 and East Post Road, uh, Highway 100 and Menards, and then uh, 7th Avenue and 31st. So if you look at the correlation on the next slide, we'll have the number of accidents. Uh, that's the red light tickets that we've had, 2016, 614. Uh, next slide. The red light tickets we've written, again, these are the intersections. You see the same three that keep popping up. That's 7th Avenue and 31st, uh, 151 and 13, and then the East Post and Highway 100. Uh, are, are kind of the problem areas that we see. Next slide. So then we did the speeding. We put speed uh, traffic cameras out on um, Highway 100 between Muneer and 31st Street. Uh, we did it for about a week. Uh, the engineering department put it out and uh, we got them in both the eastbound and westbound lanes. Go ahead, Harold. So this is kind of telling when you look at the amount of traffic going through there in just a week. Uh, the big things are the last three bullet points. 28% uh, or about 18,000 of those cars were traveling 10 miles to you know, 14 miles an hour over the speed limit. 13% uh, were going 70 to 74 miles per hour. And there was 3,500 cars that went 75 miles per hour or more just in the eastbound lanes during a week. Uh, same thing in the westbound lanes. You see that 5%, 3,200 cars going 75 miles an hour or more uh, on Highway 100 is just uh, not good. Um, I broke those down. The uh, traffic counters that they've got uh, can do a little bit of what uh, Mr. Grayball said they could do as far as telling what kind of vehicles they were. Um, on Highway 100, 50% uh, of the vehicles were vans or pickups, 2.5% were buses or trucks, and 35 were semis. I don't know where that plugs in with the actual speed violations, but that's just the cars going through. Uh, the next slide is 151. Oh, there is no more slide? Well, that's interesting. So, <laughs> <laughs> Highway 151, it was similar. They were a little bit slower, uh, but we still had over 30% of the cars were going 10 miles an hour or more over the speed limit. The number of semis was about the same at three to 5%. Uh, going through there, and that those were set up uh, south of Linair in between uh, Highway 100 and Linair in, in all four lanes. 
Um, it was pretty telling. It told me that we've got a problem. Uh, there was peak times and not so much peak times, but it, we can't have somebody out there 24 hours a day. And I think that's what these cameras would, would help us do. I tried to figure out um, some of the things that we could do to show how this would save us time. The tickets are, are it's kind of hard to quantify a time, how much time that saves um, an officer. So if you figure by the time we're sitting out there, we spot a violation, we stop them, we write them up. Uh, I'm thinking probably 20 minutes a ticket is kind of what I threw out there. And that would include red light violations. Um, so we had 614 red light tickets. So you're talking about 205 man hours in the last four or five years, 2016 to 2020. Uh, 1,547 speeding tickets uh, that were written on Highway 100 or Highway 147. That's about 732 man hours. So overall, about 37% of all of our speeding tickets that we write here are coming off Highway 100 and Highway 13. Um, again, if, if the council would approve it down the road, my thought would be is we put red light cameras at Highway 13 and 151 uh, to catch those trucks uh, turning south. Uh, I'd like it at East Post Road and Highway 100, a red light camera, because I, we've had some issues there with uh, accidents and the speed is so high. If somebody does bust through one of those, we've got problems. And then uh, uh, 7th and 31st, which seems to be the other high area. Uh, speed cameras, I would like to put one on Highway 100 down by Munir uh, and 31st, and then one on 13, someplace in between Highway 100 and, and Lynn Air um, on both sides of the road. GATSO has got um, cameras. They can do all kinds of stuff. If, if we chose to go that route in the future, they can put cameras on the uh, stop arms of a school bus. Uh, so if somebody passes a school bus that stopped when the arm's out, we can, we can get those. I know Tom Dobbs, our SRO at Linmar, told me he gets about 50 complaints a year about those going on here in town. Uh, they can put cameras up in a school zone. They're activated only when school's in session, when the, when the speed limit's 25. Um, so again, if we chose to expand that down the road, but I really think initially, uh, if we could cover these four trouble areas or five trouble areas, we'd be in, we'd be in pretty good shape. Um, the mobile street camera is what I'm, I'm really interested in because that gives us the ability to move it around in response to citizen complaints. Right now, if we get a complaint, you know, somebody says, hey, I've got cars speeding down my street, you know, I'm McGowan, you know, it's kind of hit and miss when we go out there. Normally, when we're out there in a marked car, people are going to slow down because they see us uh, from a ways away. We can put the traffic uh, trailers out. And that, again, that slows people down when they see the trailers, but it doesn't dissuade them. I think that these cameras, from what I've read about the S-curve in Cedar Rapids and what I've seen about some of the speed cameras they're using in Waterloo, uh, it, it changes driver behavior. You know, if you go on that S-curve, you're pumping the brake. It's just out of habit now that you know it's there, and that's what I hope to do here. Uh, it, it would be nice if you know a year or two from now we get one or two tickets a year out of these things. Um, I was able to pull up um, some statistics about um, the tickets that we have written that we currently write. Uh, in the, again, the last five years. Um, 58% of those are going to drivers outside of Marion. So kind of what Mr. Grayball said, it's not people necessarily living in Marion. I know out on 151, when you're looking at the highways, that's a big uh, trip down from Dubuque uh, to points uh, outside of Marion. But I do think it's something we, we should pursue. Again, I think uh, once Kara gets that ordinance drafted, uh, it'll give you time to come up with more questions and I can pull more data if you want more data take a look at the ordinance and we'll go with what you decide. If you guys want to go with it, we'll keep pushing forward. If you don't, and uh, the people here don't want it, the constituents don't want it, you know, we'll keep doing what we're doing, but I do think it's an opportunity to do something. Um, take advantage of the technology that's available. So first question is automated, auto, automatic, excuse me, automated traffic enforcement cameras have been in Cedar Rapids for several years. Yes. So why is this now coming up as a recommendation for the city of Marion in 2021? I think it's, I've just seen the uh, uh, the statistics that I think it, it makes it worthwhile. And and honestly with, and again, I'm not conceding that we racially profile anybody, but pulling data for the uh, um, equity groups from the protest last summer, 
just brought a lot of that to light. And if there are people that are concerned about us racial profiling, and I don't think that the data shows that, uh, but this is certainly a way to be somewhat responsive uh, to people that are asking for that. Yeah. All right, open it up for questions. Grant? Chief, Chief uh, you gave some uh, statistics in terms of the number of citations that were written. Yes. Uh, and those were done, those, those weren't collected over broad spans of time. Those were only done on uh, designated on shift uh, assignments that your staff uh, or your patrolman uh, uh, covered, correct? So in theory, if you can make some assumption and extrapolation of the number of violations that then might be captured on a 24 seven 365 basis through uh, uh, camera monitoring, um, we probably have a lot more violations than what you've quantified. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Your Honor, I would also add uh, with regard to your timeliness question. In the past, I would have recommended against pursuing this until the cases involving Cedar Rapids and the other cities in the state of Iowa were fully decided by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And that's only been a recent thing that Supreme. I, I believe Cedar Rapids just finished up their most recent challenge within maybe the last year, year and a half. All right. Okay. Any other questions by City Council? I do. Go ahead, Renee. Thanks. Um, so I, I wrote down a bunch of stuff. I might be a little all over the place, but I guess I want to start, Chief, with kind of what Steve was getting at, were you approached or did you go out and approach someone? Because in what I've been finding, this really caught my eye when we got this packet Friday or the link to the packet. And I started looking at where else in Iowa, et cetera. And so um, I'm wondering, how did this come to us? Did you go and look for it or were we approached? Yeah, that was me. I sought it out. I had, I, I'd been following the Cedar Rapids uh, case that was in court. Uh, I knew that they were in place up in Waterloo. I wasn't uh, aware that they had them in LeClaire and Sioux City and a couple other places, but I knew the one in Cedar Rapids. Uh, I talked to the uh, chiefs, obviously, but then the sergeants that run their programs, and I was impressed with what uh, Gatso was providing them and, and the, the fact that it's basically a free service for us, and uh, so I pursued them. Okay, thank you. Um, I get, you know, the word free in that we will make, you know, 60% profit if we pursue this, but I'm one of those people where this to me is just very big brother. So uh, I'm a little concerned. Now I get the red traffic uh, or the red light running that directly causes accidents. I, I see the need for that. The speeding I'm a little more, um, concerned about and then you started to mention other features that the camera has that we can turn on and so that whole slippery slope um, comes in so for me I guess you know I'm just one person though so I would really be interested in how all of our residents feel about this particularly if 42 percent of the tickets would would come to them um, so I, I would like to put this out there and I feel like drafting an ordinance, I don't know if we're getting too far ahead of ourselves because it really seems like then we're all on board with drafting it or if having that then gives us something to, something specific to argue at or look at or share with people. And I'm, I'm guessing that the latter point is what we would go with. Um, so I'm interested in the mobile units because I'm one of the, the council members out here and. Ward four, where I've definitely gotten a lot of speeding complaints, particularly in Echo Hill, on Alburnett, along Winslow. I mean, you know, because I reach out to you and, and you guys um, beef up staffing there and you're right, you can only do something temporarily. But um, the, so the mobile units, I like that idea. Um, everything else uh, to me, I really wouldn't want to pursue um, unless we could at least, you know, put it out in the newspaper that we're thinking about doing this. I'm not saying we commission a survey. I know that's expensive and it takes too long, but I, I don't want to um, move too quickly, particularly because the public can't come into our meetings. Um, just a couple other thoughts I wrote down. Um, sorry, my dogs are... Um, so yeah, 11 Iowa cities have it. Nine more are currently on a list to do it. I don't know if we're one of those nine. This was in a Gazette article that I read. So 
Um, it looks like, I don't know if these people are actively selling it or why everybody's starting to look at it now. Um, what else? Oh, a couple things about the officer interaction. So to your point about profiling, I get it and I've heard it, but I feel like we should fix the profiling instead of avoiding the, the interaction. Um, I think policing, so to the 20 minutes it takes to issue the ticket, um, the police officer might detect someone's un driving under the influence, which the red camera um, or the, the camera would not pick up. So I feel like we lose some opportunities there to have some, op some interactions with people where there could be something else going on. And, and um, I would hate to remove that. I also feel like with um, some of those penalties, the, um, the stimulus response thing, if, if you are breaking the law, you should know about it right away and get pulled over as opposed to a few days later, you get something in the mail. So um, the timing of that, I don't love. I like the immediate consequence. I like, <laughs> you know, that fear when you see the lights in your, your rear view and you're like, oh my God, lesson learned. Um, $50 ticket in the mail, maybe not so much. So anyway, I know I'm, I'm just kind of, like I said, I was taking notes through the presentation. I'm sure I'll have more for Thursday, but I just wanted to put it out there what I'm thinking, but um, I, I am on board for the mobiles because of being able to use them flexibly, put them in the trouble spots. Um, I'm not on board with the other stuff yet. I don't know if I would be, but I would be curious to see what the city thinks. And so um, I don't know how we would achieve that other than asking uh, Marion Times and maybe the Gazette to put something out there so that we can start hearing from people um, because ultimately, you know, if, if it seems that so many people, the majority of people are on board, maybe I'm just the person who um, feels a little prickly about this. But I know when I go to cities and I see cameras unrelated to traffic, but just on the corner of intersections and people watching, particularly in London, comes to mind. I just don't like where um, society in general is moving with all of that automation. And I work for a uh, virtual reality XR company. So I, I see a lot of things that's out there that are out there and, and possibly coming. And so um, that's just where some of my perspective comes from. That's it. I guess there's not really anything to answer other than that first question I asked. But in fairness to whoever's listening to this, I just thought I'd put it out there and I'm sure we'll talk more on Thursday. So thanks for the data. Yeah, two comments I'll add. Uh, one, one, I think I am, I certainly am going forward interested in if our police do not have to be sitting out on the highways, sitting there and waiting to write some red, red light tickets or speeding tickets. What else, how much time is that and what else can be, you know, if we can use that time for other police activities, to me, that seems to be a better use of our uh, police time. Uh, for the for the citizens again, one of the things all the citizens of Marion are looking for is they view Marion as one of the safest com communities in in the state. So I think they definitely want to uh, continue with that. The other thing that's always caught my attention is this slide that's up here, and just the percentages of people that speed uh, 65 miles an hour or more. And if you start mentioning that to people, I think that's an aspect that will catch a lot of uh, people's attention. Isn't there also a little cushion? There's a cushion. So if the speed limit is 55, there's a cushion before a citation is issued. What is that cushion? Yeah, we could set that whatever we, we would want to set it at. I, my thoughts like 12. Yeah, Cedar Rapids is, is somewhere in that range, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, yep. so that's that's a pretty big cushion, Yep. you know, for people to allow. So if you're not even going to get a citation until you're 12 over the speed limit, I think you're kind of increasing the speed limit to 65 automatically by doing that, but. And that can uh, all be addressed in the ordinance right. too. I okay. mean, that's so just a couple of comments I was gonna throw out there. Randy. Thank you. I just had one follow-up quick question because I know as this recording goes out, I'm sure we're all gonna be contacted some way um, or fashion this week. Uh, can you just tell us, uh, share with us from the other communities what they are doing with the revenues that are generated from from these citations? Can you just give us a ballpark ideas to how to answer those questions or for those listening um, can hear it? I think Cedar Rapids, I believe goes back to their general fund, but they were using it to hire more officers. They needed some additional officers so they were hiring, I think 10. Uh, Waterloo, I think it goes back into their general fund and, and gets dispersed out. Um, for us, it would be, I think it would be tracked and Leanne can 
correct me. It would be tracked as a revenue source for the police department, but it wouldn't necessarily come to us. It would go to the general fund. Is that sound right? The answer is always, it depends on what you draft the ordinance. Yeah. <laughs> so it's up to the city council. Yeah. Eventually, as we go down this road uh, on what, how that money would use. So when we draft this ordinance, is that aspect going to be included in that or does it need to be included in the draft i would i don't know if it needs to be in the ordinance we could certainly does not my recommendation would be that we have a mention of how we're going to make that determination in the ordinance but we not actually outline exactly what we're doing with it in okay. the ordinance because then if we want to make a change we have to change the ordinance as opposed to um like when we have other fee schedules we just mentioned that we have the fee schedule in the ordinance and then we put in there that we can change it by resolution okay it's a lot more efficient that's fine that keeps it general and, and generic okay will so what are we looking at for time frame on if we say yes um make an ordinance and we months i would say yeah it's it's not going to be quick i mean we'd have to get the ordinance written right that approved Right. Uh, approve the agreement with Gadso, and then whatever their timetable is for getting things in, um, inst installation and things. So I would, it's not going to happen overnight. Well, my, I mean, just yeah, just for the ordinance itself, just yeah. like Renee's point with, with potentially asking the public. Yeah. Um, there'll be three readings of an ordinance. Obviously, we could always do a, a, a time for comments from folks on yeah. on it and publicize that. So um, I think we. If it's going to be months before we even have an ordinance in place or a draft, I think we've got time to kind of get the word out there that it, it's, yeah. it's potentially I coming. Don't how, I don't know how far Carol's gotten on looking at those. It's... Uh, well, my timeline depends a little bit on how some of our other priority projects fall into place and how much of a priority council wants me to make drafting that ordinance. If you tell me you want it by the second meeting in June, I will do what I have to do to make that happen. <laughs> um, if you tell me you want it by the first meeting in June, I would say that's probably not the most likely scenario sure. to get it done. Sure. Well. And I'm not but saying to rush. Done. I'm not saying rush. I'm just saying we've got some time to yeah. get the word out there. there there's no rush. I mean, yeah. so, so we're not trying to rush this along. Mm -hmm. I think he's just asking a question. Uh, is there a time frame out there to allow for some feedback from our citizens? And I would assume that by this being discussed and on the agenda tonight, our two local newspapers may run an article yet this week or in the next several days. Grant. I think there's value in taking the time necessary to construct a good draft because then uh, going through that process as well as then our subsequent review of that draft is going to expose questions that may in fact run somewhat parallel with the concerns that uh, Renee brought up. So I don't think there's, I think the foundation of all of this is to create a good document that gives us the foundation for a program, should we choose to implement it at a later date, but then also gives us again, that stimuli to uh, really scrutinize other questions about um, the intended and un unintended consequences of the program. So. I guess I'm just expressing uh, my support for uh, getting a draft done well, and then let's take it from there. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Will. Just one, one more question. comment. Yeah. And for those that know me and know that one of my pet peeves is speeding in the uptown, so I'd be in favor of a speed camera through the uptown with maybe a three mile an hour over the limit. <laughs> Pick up the bicycles. We don't want to do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, they don't have licenses. <laughs> hey, those senior, those senior, those senior trikes can really move out. All right. Thank you, Chief. All right. Now we'll move on to engineering. And Mr. Barkalo, start with E1, talking about adopting amendments to the flood hazard area regulations. Yes, sir. So this is the new uh, FEMA flood insurance study and the flood insurance rate map, as well as the ordinance updating it with the DNR recommendations to make it in compliance. Um, this is in order to keep all of the current policies within the flood insurance program. Okay. Any questions? All right, E2. 
E2 is the project calendar for the Aircom uh, Park Sanitary Sewer. So this takes it from Medco Drive um, through some wetlands underneath the new runway and then extends it to the commercial park that would be then developed east of the airport. Um, so we did get a grant, um, $360,000. Uh, the engineer's estimate is 515,000. And right now we're proposing 47 working days and we're working out if there should be certain days for when the airport can be closed. Um, Cause obviously even with putting the casing pipes in there we'll have to dig some fairly deep holes on both sides of that casing pipe to push the pipe through. Um, and then when we're all done with the project, we would put an access fee on it like we do our other sanitary sewer projects once we know the total cost. Um, as you know, sometimes when we're 20 feet deep in Marion soils, we run into some bad material and have to backfill with some sand. So we would wait till we know what that total construction cost is um, before we set up the access fee. Okay, so this item is included in our current CIP? It is. Okay. Any questions, Grant? I think we covered this at one point, but um, would this installation uh, curtail airport operations? It will. Um, there is an easement that is being acquired from Nathan Carraway to the east. Um, he would be the, the parcel owner south of Genesis and east of the, the runway. Um, he is we're working through that temporary construction easement to be able to stockpile materials there so that the airport can be operational when not in use. But when that equipment's out there installing that pipe, we're going to have to close the airport down. Okay. okay. Item E3, talking about uh, contract amendment with Anderson Bogert. Yeah, so originally we had a contract with Anderson Bogert to draw these plans up. Um, the person who did it actually now works for the city. Um, we stole them away from Anderson Bogert. So now that we have the casing pipes in there, just updating the, the plans, um, I believe it was like $6,000 was the, the increase. Um, so it's just a, a new amended contract amount of 26420 It was six thousand nine hundred dollars was the increase to update the plans. Okay. Questions on E three? Okay. Move on to E four resolution approving contract and bond with BJ Brecky. Yep. So this uh, we had the public hearing and the award of the contract at the previous council meeting, um, where the detailed bids were presented. Um, so Brecky was the low bid, and so now this is just accepting the bonds and the contract so that they can start as late start date of August 16th of 21 with 30 working days and $300 per day in liquidated damages. Any questions on this one? And E5 is also contract and bond with BJ Brecky. Yep, so just a different project. This is our sanitary sewer manhole project. So just removing those manholes that are brick and replacing them with concrete manholes to limit the amount of water that infiltrates into our system. So any, any questions on this item? All right, thank you, Mike. Yep. And now we'll move on to community development. The first item, F1, is a resolution approving the Quick Star Central Corridor Review for property located at 3025 7th Avenue. You, go, you doing that, Tom? I am. Okay. So uh, there was a pretty lengthy uh, report submitted as part of the packet. Um, as you can see, uh, Quick Star is proposed to go in the southwest corner of the intersection of 31st Street and 7th Avenue, um, uh, just east of Arby's. Uh, they've identified their site plan as part of the review for this project. It is within the cor corridor uh, overlay district and requires a review by the Planning Commission and City Council. Um, as you can see in our report, we walked through all of the requirements and uh, they're, they're meeting those um, very specifically. Uh, their site plan is identified here. And then you, there are elevations that were in the packet that uh, illustrate each site um, or the site from all uh, four 
directions. Um, uh, I would point out that the uh, uh, gas pumps uh, as part of this are required as a uh, conditional use and they go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment this evening. So uh, if we get out of here by seven, they'll be able to approve it tonight. So that's, uh, that's going forward. Um, I, I'm fairly confident that uh, the way it's presented, that there's going to be um, support for that, um, certainly in, in, in an appropriate area for that. Um, and with that, I guess I'd just ask if there are questions. We covered everything from parking to gas pumps to elevations and accessory structures. This will have a car wash. The car wash will be directly uh, south of 7th Avenue will be the elevation uh, that you see. Um, and so you won't see the pumps. The pumps will actually be in the back. Um, which is a requirement within the uh, overlay zone. Uh, if you recall, they have to be in the back or in the side, similar to the high V uh, fresh market that was uh, proposed on the north side, just down the street from this uh, facility. Um, so unless there's specific questions, I wasn't gonna walk through the entire report. I thought Dave did a nice job uh, mm -hmm. addressing the concerns. Okay, go ahead. Qu Will's got a question. Um, what is being done for uh screen to screen like say the the trail from the property because i know if you're walking on that trail or biking on that trail seeing a bunch of gas pumps it's not very appealing yeah there there is no screening between the uh, the street and the uh trail at this point um i believe that there's some screening actually on the trail I know there's a few bushes, but bushes and shrubs, but yeah. Nothing is proposed at this point. Is what is there between the street and the pumps? Just the two trees there? There's a small island. Um, and it's difficult to see. You can see one circle. Um, uh, I can't point either. <laughs> Sorry. There, the, so just north, there's an island and there's a circle. Uh, it's identified with a, a one TE. Um, that is that's a, that's a tree, and then there's some facilities, and they're showing the underground tanks. Yep. Um, and then the pump islands uh, would be under the canopy. That's the large rectangle on the south side of the property. So, with approval, with us approving this resolution, is that setting? That's approving all of their the that, trees and everything. That is correct. Because I think, I think there I should can be... talk with staff between now and Thursday and see if there's uh, was was a conversation or if there was some if there was a reason behind there not being some sort of screening. Yeah, because uh, in my mind it seems like there should be more screening yeah. because you know it's a bunch of pumps <laughs> along the nice trail. Granted, the trail is going through a little commercial area, but mm -hmm. if it was uh, the other two buildings there, it's a little more appealing than a bunch of gas pumps in my mind. Uh, and that I, could I, be more bushes put in by the parks department too on the trail. I don't know what the answer is, but I'll check and see if there's a conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I had I had the same question as Will. I was, I was looking at that and I didn't look at that before, but as I looked at it just this evening, uh, looking at that and trying to determine what screening is there and what should be there. So maybe we could get a little more conversation just about what will happen along that uh, section. Absolutely. Yeah. Your Honor. Any other questions? Yes, please. Renee, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to um, echo what you and Will said. I, you know, I do think that we should put it there, the central corridor. We've had a lot of time spent in terms of the aesthetics and how we want things to be. And this is exactly the right time to ask for what we want. Um, I, so I do think we need something there. The only thing I don't agree with Will on, at least at this stage, is having the parks department be responsible for it because right now is when we can make the ask. So to your suggestion, Tom, I would ask you to have the conversation um, because now you've had three council members of five anyway, uh, voice that there should be some more screening. So I'd like to have quick start to it. I'll I can relay that information easily. Thank you. Okay, uh, Grant. 
Tom, um, just a minor correction in the uh, in the uh, council memo. First paragraph of the document, it says this is being located on the southeast corner. Uh, I don't know how material that is, uh, but I should be corrected if this ends up in the archives. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. What do you know a time frame on their construction on this? Um, it's my understanding they want to get moving rather quickly on it. They're usually I mean done this year, probably they're pretty quick on yeah, I don't know building if, center. I don't know if they're site ready to roll, but gotcha. yeah, I, I can find that though though I'm assuming that they'll be here on too for some of the questions that are being asked yeah. you can see that there were within the staff report there were questions there were um uh, items that weren't on the uh, site plan that were requested uh, that they've agreed to they just hadn't resubmitted them as part of the site plan so we wanted to make sure they were conditioned upon approval so. yeah i thought those were good comments yep good changes any other questions about quick start randy uh, just one follow up one. I'm, I'm having a difficult time locating the drives in and out of this location. Obviously, it'd be a shared drive with the Arby's and then from the south off of 31st. Are those the only two entrances onto that property? There's a uh, entrance going uh, southbound on 31st. Uh, there's a little angled entrance there. Okay. In the in the center of the property? I, yeah, yeah, it's uh, I just I can't point. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think it's, I, it's, I, it's, I, it's I, a the angled, back side of the building. Kind of like a slip lane. Okay, that's thank you. A, that's a southbound in only. Yep, correct. correct. Yeah. Yep. And there was an exit lane also provided um, uh, on the west side to to exit uh, exit only as well. I have another question about that. Then go ahead, Will. So. Um, if that's going to be like that is there going to be a median that's going to need to be installed on 31st or uh, which if this is the case i would say let's do that versus what they've done in cedar rapids at the quick start they just built across from target on blair's ferry road where they just put all those cone things in the road to stop people from turning i'd rather see a median put in i i think I'm, in and i would let uh engineering address this but i i think the angle upon which this one is being identified um, we felt like it was it was circumventing the situation, um, uh, like at some intersections where it's there's a raised meeting with a roll curb, right in, right out, and people just drive right over it. Um, with with the way that this one's situated, uh, I think there was a feeling that this one was at such an angle that if someone, it would be pretty substantial for somebody going northbound to to take a left into. You know, you'd almost have to do a full U-turn into that area. Because the to answer Randy's question, I guess so. The only you get that that entrance in heading south, then you've got the access road that's right in, right out, uh, right by the trail, and then the entrance next to on the other side of Arby's. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have that that back road all, all along all of the buildings, the hotel, Arby's. Yep. I mean, you got that whole Public area there, just movement. just north of the trail, that people can travel in and out of that entire area as well. Right. Yep. That was planned that way from the get go right. preliminary plat. So somebody could technically come in from come in off of the roundabout, come in right into next to uh, the buildings right there, and then come all the way on the back side and and enter in yeah, from we the can, south side of this. Tried to provide access from the from, as, as right. kind of a backage road to provide access into that whole development, understanding that even with the, I think the two access points that we have on the seventh, it's still gonna be a difficult left turning motion. I think folks will figure out <laughs> they're gonna be better off going through the roundabout or coming out here and taking a left. Going further down. On the 31st to go right. east. Yep. Okay. Any more questions about Quickstar? Grant? Yeah, just a follow-up comment, Tom. I'm I'm in support of uh, whatever augmented screening could be put in, uh, uh, consistent with Will and Renee's and and Steve's comments. I just I just think that would be a nice treatment for that. And so. Yep. Okay. 
communicate that and see if I can get something put together before the, the meeting on Thursday to present. You got that comment times four. There you go. All right. Uh, now, uh, any questions? Now we'll move on to page eight of our agenda. First item not marked is F2. Any questions on that one? If not, we'll move on to F3, which will be the public hearing regarding uh, ordinance amendments on the building codes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, so every three years I come up here and well, actually I did 2020 and we did the electrical code, but now we're back to the building codes. So every three years we update these codes. Um, actually the International Code Council up updates those. We just have to update ours to follow through. Um, we don't always change a lot in the ordinances, but we always want the, the most current because there's a lot of technology that gets um, brought into the code, um, new products, new methods. Um, actually this time there's actually some new uses um, everybody has kind of heard of the, the puzzle rooms where you, they put you in a room and they lock the door and you have to figure out how to get out. They came into the code now because they don't want people to get stuck in those. If there's a fire that goes in, you know, that they don't know how to get out the people that are running that leave and people are stuck in there. So that's even come into the code now. <laughs> so there's a lot of things. So I'm going to hit a couple highlight items on some things. Um, if you have questions, you ha should have the ordinances in front of you. Um, so if you have questions, feel free. So one of the things that we brought into the code was a radon control. Um, we've always kind of thought about bringing it in. We just haven't done it. Cedar Rapids, some of those have, have brought it in already. Um, and what it is, is it's just the, the pipe that goes in the ground and it's, an it's a passive system versus an active system. Um, and it, the, most of the contractors are doing it now anyway. So we just wanted to go ahead and get it in there. That way people aren't having to tear their walls apart or sticking it outside and run it up through the outside of the house and stuff. So we just thought it was better to get it there. Besides the fact that it, it actually is a very good thing to get the radon out of the houses. Um, the other thing on, on that is later in the ordinance, we, we have actually something we are repealing out of that ordinance, out of that. So what that is, is the, is the testing. The code now this year decided that they were going to require if you to building departments to maintain and, and well, not maintain, but to um, make sure everybody um, does their testing and everybody should do their testing, but the building department shouldn't stand over the top of them and make sure they do it. That's kind of a personal choice thing because there would have to be a fee to that. And I don't want to get into another fee but on something that really is beneficial to the people that live there. Um, then also there was, we talked earlier um, in the year about the ratio um, updates. So there was a couple of things we brought into the code for, um, for uh, to kind of combat that. One of them is the wind speed. So um, the code every year looks at, um, people will bring in statistics and say, well, the wind in this area should only be this, and there should be something else somewhere else. And it, it just, it, it gets a little monotonous because it goes one way and it goes back. So the wind speed has been 115 miles an hour. Um, and they wanted to take it down to 107, which what, eight miles an hour probably isn't that big a deal. But we left it at 115 just because that's where it's been. We all know that we had 120, 140 mile an hour winds around here. So I think better is, the higher is better. Um, and also to combat some of the, you've seen roofs that have lifted off. Um, it's probably not going to help the person that lost the, the shingles. It may not even help the person that lost some of their plywood, but the people that lost their trusses and, and their rafters and they had, you know, roofs completely gone. Um, we, we put in a requirement for some uplift protection above and beyond what the code already asked for. Um, hopefully that will, it's not a, it's not a real expensive thing. It might be, you know, on a, on a pretty good size house, might be a couple hundred dollars. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's $200 is pretty cheap. So um, the other thing that we are really doing and, and to combat some of this is a wind bracing on, on walls. Um, we noticed that um, during the ratio, the places we had the most problem was where the, wind, where the wind blew the garage door out. Wind gets inside that garage and just lifts it up. Um, we really can't combat that because there's really, it's a garage door. I mean, you can only do so much with a garage door. But we, we are 
beefing up our inspections for the actual um, returns on the walls beside that garage door to help make sure that those things are um, anchored properly and fastened properly so that if that garage door pops out, hopefully that will help keep the, the garages from going. So between that and the, and the uplift, we're hoping that that kind of takes care of some of that. A um, couple other things that we, we changed, um, we're asking for frost protected landings. We've always had that in the code. It's just been kind of gray. Um, so whether you have to have them or not. Um, the code, so if you walk out of a out of a door and you're stepping down onto the grass, you don't have to have a, a landing on that. The grass is a, is a landing, or if you want to put a concrete slab there, that's fine. But if you have a door that swings out, and this is mostly in commercial, it's not in residential, you have a door that swings out and, and you don't have a frost protected landing and that heaves the, the concrete up that door, it's not going to open. So if there's a fire or something in the middle of winter and that's that door won't open, this, um, their people are in trouble. They're gonna find another way out. Um, so we are requiring, and it's, it's always been there that you have to have that door open. It's kind of a fire department requirement. Is that, that for egress in this building too, but the fire department really looks at it really close um, when they're doing their yearly inspections. And we just think that it's best to have just a black and white, you're gonna have a frost protected footing outside that, that uh, for that landing outside the door. That way there is no question if that thing is gonna heave up and, and keep somebody from exiting. Um, one of the other things that we changed were swimming pool barriers. This was actually in the code or in our ordinance um, a few years back. And the last time we updated, I don't know how it didn't get put in there, but it, it got missed. Um, but we put it back in there. And what that is, is it's just a barrier that's required around the pool if the people have a uh, power pool cover. So if you have an underground or an in-ground pool and you have a power cover, the code would have said that you don't need to have a barrier. But we all know that people leave those open. Um, maybe it's just for a few hours, they're gonna go inside real quick and then, but you know, the thing is some kid, little kid can walk up there and they could drown in a few minutes. So we really want the, the barrier to be there even if they have um, the power pool cover. So that's what that one was about. Um, one of the things that, is a change that I'm not real pleased with is uh, energy efficiency. The state has um, come out and said, and this was quite a while ago and we kind of missed it the last time, um, that, that there's a state mandated energy code. Um, and it, it refers to the, the 2012 energy code, which is less stringent than what we're actually using, but there is a, a law that we have to abide by the state energy code. So. Um, we are going to go by the state energy code to keep ourselves out of trouble. Again, I don't think it's, it's that great. And in, in, in talking to the state, um, they're in the process of moving forward to adopt the latest 2021 uh, energy code. So I think it'll happen, but I don't think it'll happen for a year or maybe two. So we thought, well, we better just go with the state and be done with that. Um, the other thing is accessibility standard. Um, I've always been very pro accessibility. You really need to be able to get people with walking disabilities, wheelchairs, that kind of thing in a building and they need to have um, good access. The 2021 code is actually um, taking the um, um, 2017 accessibility code and is what it's referencing. The 2017 is not gonna be adopted by the uh, federal ADA. It's not gonna be adopted by the state for a few years. Um, so we decided to go ahead and, and use the one we're using. It's a 2009, it's a little older, but it's still very efficient for what we use. Um, so we decided that we would go with, with the 2009 instead of the 2017. Um, so we changed the reference in there to reference the, the older code. Um, I think the only one in our area that's going to try and make it work go is, is Hiawatha is going to try and do it. And um, I was tempted to go with him, but I just, I just think if we have a state um, building a, um, a nursing home or something that the state inspects, it's gonna have a lot of conflict in, in trying to um, work that through that. So we decided not to go that way. So that kind of covers the highlights of that. I'll go through the plumbing code real quick, which is not gonna take long because that one, the only change is the fact that the state's telling us we can't use our own plumbing code. We have to use the state plumbing code. So now we are referencing the state of Iowa plumbing code. Um, and that's pretty much 
what it is. We have a few amendments to it for the water department it has some, some rights that the water um, definitely wants. And if they, if the state wants to challenge the water department on that, we'll let them, but that's the, uh, I don't think they will. And that's just we, the only amendments we really have in there. Um, the mechanical code and the housing code, we really didn't change anything other than the, the date on the, on the code. Um, it's referencing the 2021 instead of the 2018. Uh, and the property maintenance code is pretty much the same way. We did add um, a kitchen uh, GFCI outlet requirement. The code, again, is pretty gray. And it, there is things in there that talks about the danger, electrical dangers and electrical hazards. You know, you, we can mitigate those when we go do our inspections, um, but it's not real clear. So we wanted to clear it up. We're making it black and white now. If you have a kitchen and you don't have a GFCI, you got to put it in. So... There shouldn't be any any um, uh, discussion on on that um, as far as the customers go. Um, so we have ran this through legal. Um, the changes are recommended by our staff and they're recommended by the the construction code review board. They looked at them last month. Um, we sent copies to the uh, Greater Cedar Rapids Housing and Home Builders Association. And I have not heard anything back from them. So um, we're assuming that, you know, silence is golden. So and that's what I got. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Well, Gary, thanks for giving us at least pointing out some of those highlights. I think it makes a lot of sense that we anticipated that there might be a few in the building code sure. related to uh, housing, building a house and some of the derecho related changes. Yeah, so, that was that was really one of the points we really wanted to get across. We really yeah. wanted to try and make it so these houses are, you know, we, heaven forbid we ever get another storm like that. But if we do, hopefully we'll be, you know, prepared from the building side too, so. Any questions for Gary? Randy. Thank you, Gary. Um, did the change, you just mentioned something about the GFCIs in the kitchens. Did that change any of the ruling? Um, the current ruling was, was it six feet? If there was an outlet within six feet, did it modify that at all? No. Okay, it was just that we're identifying a kitchen that must be in a, a separate circuit or on a protected circuit. Yeah, if you either use the, the outlet or a circuit can be, you know, can have a circuit breaker in the panel that would be. Okay. A lot of these older houses, they can't do that, so they have to go with the, the, the outlet. Right, okay, great, thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, thanks. All right, that takes care of items F3 through F8. And now we have F9 related to a resolution approving a 28E agreement with the city of Cedar Rapids. Um, this, this is just a fairly straightforward uh, 28E agreement with Cedar Rapids regarding uh, jo the joint uh, planning study, study area between uh, essentially Albernet and, and uh, Robbins uh, north of East Robbins Road to a quarter section past uh, County Home Road. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll do a joint RFP uh, we'll both be involved in uh, identifying and selecting the uh, consultant. There'll be a consultant service contract associated with this. Uh, we're pretty excited about getting this started. There's a lot of development up in this area, and I think it's just going to be a good project for the two communities to work together on. So, I believe that the uh, I, I believe that the agreement went through Cedar Rapids uh, at their last city council meeting. So, we should be. I think forward. it makes a lot of sense to do some planning out in that area. That certainly is going to be a growth area uh, in the next 10 years for both communities. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Questions for Tom regarding this item here? Okay. Uh, F10 is not marked. Any questions on F10? Okay. We'll jump on to the last page, 9, F11, resolution regarding acquisition plats. So this is this is rather exciting. Um, this is the first piece of Tower Terrace Road west of Albernet Road um, being uh, identified and and um, essentially um, identifying the parcel that the the city uh, would be purchasing from the Downings uh, as a part of Tower Terrace West. We'll be bringing these uh, through uh, for the next few meetings. Uh, the, there's acquisition flats associated with the Klobeck property and as well as the Jacobs property that will also associ uh, be associated with purchase agreements. Um, I have all the documents in order. Um, it's my understanding that uh, uh, 
uh, the Lewises and, and the Cedar Rapids right away agents have worked worked out a deal. Uh, we've just kind of put them into the uh, uh, City of Marion's uh, format, um, and I'll be presenting those to the Lewises here in the next week or so. Hopefully, have purchase agreements on the agenda next meeting. Um, there is a purchase agreement that has been secured for the Jacobs property, which is further west of here. Um, but at this point, there is not an agreement with the Klobuck family on, on the piece of property between the Jacobs and Lewis. So. But we'll be moving documents through and hopefully getting uh, uh, at least all the properties outlined in the next couple of months. Um, and if, if all acquisitions can be acquired um, before, um, before too long, there should be some grading or possibly be some grading. And Mr. Barclow didn't throw anything at me, but um, <laughs> uh, this fall, uh, late fall, winterish, um, out there between, uh, oh, about halfway between C and Alburnett to Alburnett, if that makes any sense. Well, this is one of the very key steps, first steps on getting that additional piece of Tower Terrace, which is absolutely essential to the traffic flow for Northern yep. Marion going West. So very critical. Yep. Glad to hear that. Any questions on this? Okay. Next one, F12, related to a temporary location for Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust. Uh, yes, yeah, so this this request came in and, and um, apologize, I, I need to get the MOU to the council and I will, I'll be yeah. moving that forward. But uh, as you'll recall, uh, uh, CRBT uh, Bank uh, located at uh, 20, uh, 725th Street, they just went through a corridor review process and they're, they're, re they're tearing down the bank building replacing it with a brand new bank. Uh, as part of that, um, they, they need to have the branch open or there's, there are specific requirements included in the banking industry that will not allow them to remove the bank or close the branch for a period of time um, without some steps that need to occur. Um, they did come to us a, a little late saying, hey, we'd really like to, to, to work with the city and, and get a temporary location. Generally, I believe in the industry, they try to do these on the same site as a building, um, but it just really, that site is already small and they weren't able to do that. Um, so in this instance, we, we've taken a look uh, at our code and there, because of the temporary, uh, because the building will be a temporary building, a lot of our codes are not situated to allow for structures that are temporary by standard. So we, understanding that we wanna provide for this, uh, we did uh, work out an MOU in which uh, we're ex extending some of the regulations regarding a temporary structure to beyond that. And so there's some exceptions to the code that the council is providing for in that MOU. I will email that to the council and have uh, the letter and illustrations for this uh, before Thursday. Um, but essentially we've, we've worked out uh, the ability to place the building, understanding they gotta meet certain codes, fire codes, building codes, building plans have been submitted for review there's some ADA accessibility issues they're, they're going to need to address. It will have an ATM and a drive through on the site. Mm -hmm. And uh, the agreement would be in place for uh, up to 12 months or until they get uh, the ability to temporarily occupy their building uh, and, and, and exit the, the area, which I'm assuming they're going to want to be out of there just as fast as we're going to want them to be out of that area as well. So we're trying to work with them and uh, they've been good thus far, um, but it will create It'll be an interesting <laughs> location and uh, situation for the for the coming months, but I think this probably, you know, benefits them, and we certainly want to uh, be able to appreciate their new building and their facility. So, okay. well, I think I'm I'm glad to see the city accommodate that because that that's a nice to see them making that investment and and uh, staying out there. Any questions on this item F12? Okay, the last item on the agenda for discussion is F13. And yes, this is, uh, as I, I presented, uh, I think I think at the last meeting, we presented the scope work related to the uh, East Marion sub area plan being created north of 151. Mm -hmm. At that time we had a scope of work, but we did not have the actual contract. And so this is uh, just approving uh, amendment number one to the contract. We're using the, the underlying contract that we've used with RDG for other planning. That's why uh, other planning activities. So that's why you're seeing it as an amendment number one to that. So okay. um, 
so it's in the amount of 18750 which was presented as a part of the scope as well okay any questions on f13 all right thank you tom and under other department discussion we have one item for discussion regarding growth management hello amal hello everyone so uh today's conversation is about the complicated relationship uh, between growth and infrastructure but i promise you i'll be brief <laughs> Uh, so I'll give you an update on where we at, um, and I'll be looking for your comments and input uh, on the approach we're taking. So how we grow um, drive our need for infrastructure. And at the same time, infrastructure can be limiting to growth. For example, currently we have a moratorium on development north of town because of uh, sewer capacity. And also uh, at the same time, there is this fact that when it comes to infrastructure, not all locations are created the same. Uh, thanks to GIS, now we know more about location impacts. Some areas are just expensive to serve. Um, to understand our sewer system uh, condition and capacity, uh, and to understand the impact of growth on that system, we hired HDR as a consultant to model the whole system for us and to assess the impact of those growth areas. And they done a great job and they presented us with uh, our needs to address existing conditions and also a potential need uh, for uh, improvements to accommodate our 2040 uh, growth. Um, staff took the outcome of that uh, modeling and report and got to work on um, a strategic and a proactive uh, approach to address um, infrastructure planning. Um, and that is addressing it at land use level. Uh, today, we are recommending uh, planning integration as an approach to growth management. So the chart in front of you uh, describes uh, the structure we're proposing, and um, the gray area represents our growth management strategy. And basically here we're saying uh, we're recommending integration between land use planning and systems planning, and that is uh, our sewer system, a street system, and a facilities system. And also we're recommending a consultation with uh, the newly developed uh, fiscal impact model and the uh, sewer impact model as well. Um, so uh, first steps we've taken uh, is, uh, Carol, next. So we broke down our growth areas into five uh, areas based on sewer systems. And we put together considerations and uh, a list of uh, evaluative criteria uh, we thought we should be uh, considering or using to rank those areas relative to each other. Um, First consideration was uh, sewer serviceability. This is basically our existing infrastructure and potential costs for service. Uh, we uh, ranked the areas relative to each other. Uh, Todd steiger uh, um did this exercise. We appreciate his time, uh, him taking the time to do this. Um, and also we have a model for fire service. And, the, and that model, model is based on our uh, network system and uh, speed limit and also our existing deployment locations. So we have a benchmark that is for every address uh, for coverage. Every address is covered within four minutes drive from uh, a deployment location. 
And based on that model and based on input from uh, Fire Chief, we rank those areas relative to each other uh, based on our readiness to serve those areas. And also major consideration is the sanitary sewer serviceability. This is basically based on HDR model uh, and outcome. Uh, Darren um, uh, Andreessen, assistant city engineer, he took the time to break those costs down to per acre. And so we, we rank the areas relative to the cost. And also we considered our street system. This is existing uh, major streets network. Uh, so we rank them based on our readiness to serve. So that would be existing uh, developed mileage and potential need and demand on our CIP. Uh, also consideration was uh, stormwater management. Uh, Steve Cooper, uh, our stormwater coordinator, <laughs> took the time to address this criterion. And embedded within this criterion are three criteria. One is potential generation for runoff and also uh, considering our existing stormwater management infrastructure and potential need and uh, also uh, impact on water quality. And uh, another consideration was based on our existing land use. That is, uh, we rank the areas based on the opportunity for fulfilling community needs, such as higher density affordable housing, for example, how the areas will compare relative to each other, and also potential for uh, commercial space um, in the area. And also we added a return on investment, and that is um, given existing conditions, uh, how likely is it the area fully develops within a reasonable time frame, just knowing the development market, uh, knowing the property in Marion. So we thought this should be a, an important factor to consider. What if we extend uh, infrastructure to fully serve the area? Will it be developing in a reasonable time frame uh, to support that infrastructure? Carol, if you can move. So the outcome, uh, as you see in the map, we broke it based on sewer systems into two areas. Uh, blue are favorable areas and orange are less favorable. Considerations or concerns with this outcome is our first, um, the north east corner is uh, supposed to be a primary growth area because it has a lot of potential uh, for commercial growth. It should be a primary growth area. So what are we gonna do about it? Carol, if you can move to the next slide. So we're recommending revisiting land use in that area, uh, preferably if we can develop a master plan uh, with uh, our existing models. Uh, and uh, in the meanwhile, we are recommending that staff only uh, review and approve development on a case-by-case -case basis to allow for commercial growth and also to allow for low impact uh, development until we have a good uh, idea on what we wanna see on those areas. And also if council agrees with the approach, We'll be recommending staff working on policy to support those uh, preferred development areas. I have uh, Tom Kerhan here and Nick Glue here. If you have any comments on their perspective on the outcome. Great yes, comments. I, I still need to talk about uh, sewer, our recommendations for sewer, but it would be a good time to bring uh, in comments and address them here. Well, we, we knew a few months back from that sewer presentation you were given to us that the amount of dollars included in that was far in excess of what we're going to be able to do in the next 
several years. So I think we anticipated there had to be some prioritization put on that in some manner. And so I think what you're giving us here is kind of a step in that direction based upon where you see growth happening, that there's some prioritization to be done in I don't know the sanitary sewer, but a number of these other areas. So got a lot of good information. I think what this is indicating to me is showing that our staff is really presenting this in, in, a, in a professional manner, taking all of the different aspects of development and trying to bring them all together in a sound recommended plan. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more work to do on it. Yeah, <clears throat> so one of the things that, you know, we're, we can only do with what we have at the time that we have information, right? So we have, one of the things that we talk about a lot internally is there's other factors, you know, other development factors, uh, whether it's the school or road, you know, availability for large grants. Um, so for instance, you know, <clears throat> if the school came in tomorrow and said, hey, we need to build, <clears throat> excuse me, on the, the ground east of Echo Hill Road, it's in our secondary area. I mean, so we've got to be able to respond. And, and so that, so there will be times upon which we, we look at it, it's just another tool that we can use um, as we evaluate development. No different than there's an extremely large grant potential for Tower Terrace Road. And a lot of the Tower Terrace Road east of 35th is not in the primary, but obviously if there's availability to build roads and such, we're gonna, you know, we're going to take a look at this and say that, but for all of this, we also have these things that, that we need to, uh, to consider as we use the tool. <clears throat> it may help us build our CI, it, what it really does is help build our CIP and policy as we look at development. If a developer came in and said, hey, I want to build a, a, a 10 acre development and build, you know, 25 houses out here and it's in our secondary, we, we may not be able to accommodate any assistance, whether it's oversizing, over depth, sewer extensions, just because that's not a place that that we have as a primary zone and, and we would use some of these evaluation tools to see about a rate of return and, and cost to the city and such. So it does provide some guidance to the development community as well and will likely lead to some policy conversations as we move down the road. Well, regardless of whatever we come up with, we've got to have flexibility and do something. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be some instances where you're going to say, hey, that's beyond the realms of possibility because it makes no sense for the city to invest in sewer and roads going out to a, uh, an area that's too far out. But yet, it gives all the developers and everybody in the city at least uh, an initial plan so that they can look at that and based upon, based upon all of those factors outlined, this is our initial plan as it looks today once that is rolled out. So I think to me, it's a lot of things that we've talked about I've been city council. How can we plan the growth of our city? Because we're anticipating more growth. Where's that growth going to happen? If we can't predict 100% accuracy today, where that's going to happen, but at least we can give some guidance as to where we uh, are best able to support that development. Right. Open it up for comments. So if I understand it's at a high level, kind of the process that you're going to be utilizing um, it, for the primary development areas, we're long-term going to be developing some visions and development standards and some modeling and plans to guide that ultimately in those primary areas. But in the short term, so that's a longer term activity. So in the shorter term, anything that is that is proposed for a primary development area is going to be handled on a case by case basis. It, do I have that correct? For the secondary areas. Secondary. Yes. OK. So policies should support the preferred areas because they are all in line and there are sustainable development given the existing land use. So do in the primary areas, do we already have development standards defined? No, we don't, we're still recommending uh, sub-area plans because it's 
more detail, it gives a good picture and it helps the infrastructure planning overall. If okay. we have uh, the neighborhoods figured out and we have a good vision on what needs to happen, uh, will help us influence the plan, the process of the plan itself will help us influence <coughs> development choices right. mm -hmm. when we zone it for the specific zone and we at by, by that time we also we will have considered the fiscal impact of the whole area through the fiscal impact modeling so the outcome should always be better uh, should be sustainable fiscally responsible from infrastructure uh, standpoint because we have a good picture we know better about the capacity and how to plan for it ahead of time and also uh, on the financing side uh, it will give us the opportunity to get into development agreements with developers if we know for example the neighborhood park in what form should that neighborhood uh, park be ahead of time would make it easier to get into um, agreements with developers to help the overall neighborhood uh, and in, in the financing as well using tax increment financing that would be a very <coughs> flexible way to finance infrastructure well i what i uh, will freely admit is i need to internalize more of the detailed memo that you provided the council which i thought kind of laid this out I, there's some subtlety that's conveyed in there that i think is important to understand so uh, thank you for that memo by the way um, okay. Okay, Nick, go ahead and give us some of your comments. Thank you. Um, Amal invited me to be here, and I, I really appreciate it. a couple of weeks ago when she started drafting this memo. She reached out and said, "Help, you know, what, what's the perspective from an economic development uh, standpoint?" I think my comments really kind of line up with uh, what Tom just shared. You know, as, as I look at this and and see how we identify identify primary and secondary development areas, you know, my perspective is I want to make sure we're not just aligning that to things like you know, sanitary sewer transportation, that's really important. I think when we look at ROI, you can look at some key uh, areas that today are, I think, very easily labeled secondary that I would suggest we need to figure out and do some advanced master planning so that we can move that into primary. Case in point, Tower Terrace Road intersection with Highway 13. I think in a lot of ways, every time I walk into somebody's office and say, you know, we've got somebody that's interested in this tract of land along Highway 13, it's a million different reasons that it's gonna be a challenge, you know, and it's a lot of the reasons are, you know, why we're having this discussion because we know there's a significant amount of dollars that we need to be, to be investing in order to open up that Highway 13 growth corridor. My, my concern is, you know, you look at where we've had growth, uh, you look at, I'm still not embracing this name, East Town Crossing. Is it East Town <laughs> or East End? <laughs> you know what we're talking about. Formerly known as. Yeah, right. I, yeah. I don't even know if I can say that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we've got some great traction that, that's happening there. And we look at, well, where's next? We continue right. to develop this sports tourism uh, economy, where's that type of development serving those types of assets going to go next? And uh, I, I think Highway 13 is going to continue to have pressure. And while we all know that making that big leap out to Squaw Creek Crossing might be one thing, where is that next uh, area that we can be ready as a community? So that's a good example where today, Tower Terrace Road, that we're also putting lots of energy into investing in that next corridor, where, how can we make sure we're ready? And so Highway 13 and Tower Terrace Road is an example of where I think um, from an economic development standpoint, we need to push back and say, how can we make this primary and be able to proactively address that with the development community when they when they bring us projects? So I think that's an example of the type of balancing that, you know, as we start getting maps that la label primary and secondary, well, where are those pockets that we need to make primary? Um, recognizing there's a little bit of a conflict with perhaps some of the infrastructure challenges that we have. Well, and even you and I have had a few brief conversations about where's the next industrial park, yep. because the Marion Enterprise is starting to get filled up. And so we know sometime in the next several years, we got to be talking about another industrial park uh, to support that investment that's needed in the commercial industrial area. 
And the good thing is I can look at this document and I can look at the sanitary sewer study and I can say, okay, we feel pretty good looking at a few things that we can do to position ourselves to continue to grow uh, in an eastward direction. So that's great. Uh, I think the, the challenge is on some of these commercial nodes that still are just as high of a ROI from a tax base standpoint as what an industrial development could be. Um, but we've got a couple key areas that I think warrant some, some really intentional planning to make sure they, they fit this process well. Well, I think that's just an indication that, that going forward, we can put together this plan. And I think there's certainly a lot of benefit to doing this, this type of a plan from a planning standpoint and providing guidance to uh, everybody working in the city and developers. But again, it's got to have flexibility uh, as we move forward It's subject to change based upon what's happening and where that might occur. We all understand, and I think we've got to understand and agree on that, but it does drive, I think Tom's point, a lot of these issues and subjects here does drive the CIP, at least on a five-year plan, where's that investment gonna be? And based upon a plan like this, I think it does uh, solidify some of that planning, at least for a, on a five-year basis. So, any more questions? on this topic? Renee, any questions, comments? No, I just love, you know, this future casting and getting it organized. I think it's a great idea. I'm glad we're doing it and um, makes good sense. Okay, all right. Thank you, Amal. Thank okay. you. Yeah. I, I just wanted to cover uh, our recommendation for summer. Oh, sorry, go so ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so we're based on all the considerations and uh, what we um, reviewed so far, uh, we're recommending uh, priority number one is to address the existing issues with the system. Uh, priority two is addressing anticipated issues or deficiencies uh, based on uh, infill. Those are areas uh, currently within our boundaries. Um, prior to also, uh, we can start on projects to accommodate uh, growth areas, uh, the preferred ones. And uh, prior to three would be uh, uh, addressing uh, full development for the secondary area. Okay. Thank you, Amal. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that is the last item for discussion tonight. Now we have a closed session. Will? I make a motion to adjourn to closed session regarding litigation as permitted under section 21.51C of the Code of Iowa. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second to adjourn to closed session. Can we have our opinion from our legal? reviewed the proposed subject matter for the closed session and find the same to be appropriate under Iowa Code 21.51C. Roll call. Mr. Harper. Yes. Mr. Jensen. Yes. Mr. Brandt. Yes. Ms. Gadelia. Yes. Mr. Sternad. Yes. Okay, our meeting is now adjourned to closed session. Thank you. <laughs>